the Spirit Airlines documentary you've been waiting for. Simply say to them, I don't care, my planes are full. We care about what our customers care about, which is price. Spirit employs just over 12,000 people and makes $5 billion annually by completing just 500 flights per day to more than 60 locations throughout the Western Hemisphere. But just a little over 40 years ago, it was nothing more than a small trucking company based out of Michigan. How did one man manage to take a company on wheels to be in an airline that operated more like a mom and pop business? We were in growth mode and Ned was still running it as a mom and pop operation. Who focused on taking travelers to popular gambling destinations to be in one of the most dominant, low cost carriers in the span of 40 years. This is the hard to find true story of Spirit Airlines and its founder, Ned Homefield. Ned Homefield, founder of Spirit, lived a very private life, but those closest to him recall that he loved the great outdoors and hanging out with family and friends. He was the guy everyone wanted to hang out with. As a teenager, he competed in sailboat racing and years later told a journalist, The competition in sailing is much like the competition in many of the businesses I've been in. If there are 40 boats that are exactly the same, the same sails, the same hulls, the same weight, they ideally have the same speed. It's how you sail your boat that determines whether you win or lose a race. He had a passion for designing racing yachts and a goal to compete in the American Cup, a dream that changed along the way. But it was evident from a young age that Ned also loved to build and sell things. When he entered college at the University of Michigan, he pursued a degree in marine engineering, but later dropped out because one of his side businesses, a trucking company, started to take off. Clipper Trucking, a Detroit-based trucking company that he founded in 1969 while being in college, delivered parts to auto plants in Detroit and Cleveland for several clients, but his biggest being Chrysler. While things were looking good, it didn't last forever. His business slowed down dramatically during the OPEC oil crisis of the mid-1970s. Within a few weeks, the need for his services came to a complete halt. Ned said there was no cushion, nothing gradual about it. But the young Ned wasn't one to give up. He converted his business into a factoring company. A factoring company in trucking is a way for truckers to receive much faster payment for their services. Ned started out by focusing on other trucking companies, but soon realized that small commuter airlines and air freight forwarders needed this service as well. He said, we changed who we were to accommodate the times, and by 1981, Homefield was in the clear and his profits were soaring. He had a company approach him, seeking investment to help them expand their air charter operations, but Ned declined to invest in them. But after pondering on the idea a bit more, he realized the idea he was pitched wasn't all that bad, but that he should be the one to execute on it. This bit of thinking completely changed the trajectory of his company and the future impact he would have on the aviation industry. Ned got to work crafting his plan and moving the pieces in place for his new operation. He started by flying into Atlantic City using airplanes that were owned by other companies, but they were being underutilized. This operation came to be known as Charter One. Charter One started out by marketing their day trips to casino-bound gamblers from Chicago to Atlantic City. A few years later, he added a route from Boston to Atlantic City that was available only twice a month. But the man grew so fast that he quickly increased operations on that route to a daily operation as well. Looking at what he had built, he realized that he had a loyal customer base of casino-bound gamblers that he could count on. So in 1992, he went all in and rebranded Charter One to Spirit Airlines. Under Spirit, they established flight plans from Atlantic City and Detroit to Florida cities such as Orlando, Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, and Fort Myers. When someone told Ned that you are a niche carrier, Ned responded by saying, we are a niches carrier. The objective is to develop a multitude of niches. The reason for this strategy is that they were essentially a small, mom-and-pop-like carrier compared to the likes of American Airlines and United. The fact was, if a stronger competitor wanted to compete head-on in a particular route, they would win with ease on both price and frequency of flights. 
Men knew he wasn't going to be the biggest and baddest airline anytime soon, so he found a way to get in where he fit in, which meant providing flight routes where there was no service or where more service was needed, which always involved connecting smaller markets. Over time, Loyal Spirit customers grew accustomed to flying very frequently, but would this be enough to help Spirit survive the crisis that was heading their way? In 1996, ValueJet Flight 592 was on a regularly scheduled flight from Miami International Airport to Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta Airport. About 10 minutes after taking off from Miami, it crashed into the Everglades because of a fire in its cargo compartment caused by mislabeled and improperly stored hazardous cargo. 110 people on board lost their lives due to the airline's negligence. This incident sent shockwaves across the airline industry, but particularly hit small airlines and discount carriers the most. In Ned's words, we got hammered and lost customers. The major airlines were determined to exploit the vulnerable smaller airlines and any revenue that was left quickly evaporated with the fierce competition. They all increased capacity around the most valuable routes that Spirit had and even reduced their prices, often coming in cheaper than Spirit's. They even began offering extra frequent flyer miles to passengers flying along the same routes. These tactics absolutely hammered Ned's airline in many markets. While Ned was in disarray, he didn't waste any time coming up with a strategy. He reassessed his company's strengths and played into them. He recognized that small airlines are unique and that they can move quickly. So they dropped markets, changed markets, and added more planes to other markets where they could win. They also, for the first time in Spirit's history, started to focus on advertising. Ned began to feature his pilots, flight attendants, and even mechanics on TV commercials so that passengers can identify with Spirit's staff on a personal level. Up until this point, he purposely tried to keep a low profile for himself as well as his company so that competitors wouldn't size them up and attempt to compete directly. He even said, if we were invisible to them, then we could exist without them attacking us too much. Previously, they relied on direct mail campaigns to attract customers instead of developing relationships with travel agents. They never threw parties or went to travel shows to meet travel agents, so they were also not an available option in their system. Though it was fine to forego these activities early on, Ned quickly adjusted because in his own words, it became obvious that we were being aimed at. If we were going to be shot at anyways, we wanted to make sure as many people knew about us as possible. Because of Ned's fun-like nature and being a natural-born entertainer, in no time, travel agents began to recommend Spirit over the major airlines, and this revenue stream grew rapidly, eventually accounting for 40% of Spirit's bookings. During this journey, Ned came to the realization that one travel agent can talk to 100 people in a week. He can't. What also helped was that larger airlines were cutting back the commissions paid to these agents and showing them no love. So Ned sweetened the incentive structure with a golf vacation program that came with a commission bonus of 10%. Coming out of this crisis, the employees and Ned grew incredibly close. He always been really good to his employees and many truly felt like they were family. Ned would say, you have to be caring toward the people that work for you. You have to realize that when people don't work out in a particular job position, some of the blame is your own. Whether it's for not properly training them, not properly managing or not properly directing management, you have to look at the situation through everybody else's eyes as well as your own. Loyalty should flow in both directions. And while you can definitely learn how to become a better entrepreneur, there is such a thing as a natural born one and Ned Homefield deserves much more accolades than he has been given. Little to no videos have been made about this man, so please share this video so that his story can be more widely known. As you can probably tell, we make videos on a wide range of topics covering stories that are popular and some that are not so popular. And because we are so new, you can really help shape the content of this channel by letting us know what you want to see. Anyways, I really appreciate you. Thank you for subscribing. And now, let's get back to the story.
In 2004, Spirit sold a 51% stake to LA-based Oak Tree Capital Management, and at the same time, Ned Homefield retired. And before we go into what has become of modern-day Spirit Airlines, we must say, Ned Homefield sadly passed away from leukemia in 2016. To his family, he was known as Crazy Uncle Ned, who enjoyed pulling off pranks and firing off rockets at family reunions. He was a great guy, full of energy, and was certainly fun to be around. And though his dream of racing sailboats remained just a hobby, he went on to make a dent in something much larger than he had ever initially imagined. After Ned stepped away from Spirit, Spirit experienced large losses from 2004 to 2006. The industry was becoming super competitive, and there started to be more overlap among airlines, which caused direct competition. Even the big boys, such as American Airlines, United, and Delta, started to dabble in the LCC space, which is short for low-cost carrier. Spirit was in trouble financially, so they went back to the drawing board and came up with an idea to operate more like Ryanair. Ryanair was an airline that operated in Europe under a model called ULCC which stands for Ultra Low Cost Carrier. Spirit became the first ULCC in the US in 2007. During this time, Spirit also started to experiment with edgy and controversial advertising. They used cheap jokes and double meanings that often led to even more exposure because of the reactions from people and media outlets. Every time a big scandal came along, Spirit took full advantage of it. The first of these types of ads was kind of dark in nature. They made a game that was called Hunt for Hofa, in which the player had to dig around to find the missing union leader, Jimmy Hofa's body, but still, they were just warming up. The next campaign went in a different direction. The slogan was, Many Islands, Low Fares. Then, in 2009, Tiger Woods found himself on the front of the tabloids because he got caught having an affair with a nightclub manager named Rachel. A few days later, he crashed his car in front of his Florida mansion around 2 a.m. The rumors that were swirling around was that he crashed because his then wife Ellen was trying to confront him. Now Spirit, not one to miss a good opportunity, quickly created a targeted ad called the Eye of the Tiger Sale. But you see, Spirit doesn't need a scandal or a person to make light of a situation. In the spirit of Harbor Day, where individuals and groups are encouraged to plant trees, Spirit's ad said, hug a tree or two or three, celebrate Harbor Day and go green with Spirit's wait for it, tree some sale. Oh, and speaking of environment, when BP had a huge oil spill off the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, which they settled out of court by paying more than $20 billion in 2016, even though the damage continues to be ongoing and significant, Spirit at least mocked them by having an ad on their website that said, check out the oil on our beaches. Now, in America, we seem to have a tradition of making fun of our politicians whenever we get the chance. And truth be told, if you're a politician and you do something scandalous, you expect to get burned by comedians. But an airline, only Spirit can pull that off. The day after Arnold Schwarzenegger left office as the governor of California, information of his affairs surfaced. The former actor admitted that he fathered a child named Joseph who was already 14 years old at the time. But the mother wasn't Arnold's wife, Maria. But instead, it was his family's maid, Mildred. So what did Spirit's marketing department have to say about this? They came up with an ad that said, fares so low, you can take the whole family, including that half brother you just met. And before you think, oh, they were just targeting Arnold because he was a Republican, they also got Anthony Weiner, a Democrat from New York, and at first glance, a very easy target. Spirit couldn't resist, and their ad said, the Weiner sale, with fares too hard to resist. Now, I must warn you, the backstory to this Anthony guy is just gross and pathetic. He served as the U.S. representative for New York's 9th Congressional District from 1999 until he resigned in 2011 because he got caught sending sexually suggestive photos of himself to different women. 
two years after the scandal, he ran for the Democratic primary and somehow actually managed to come in fifth place. Like how does someone like him even get on the ballot? But putting that aside, in 2017, he really went off the rails and was sentenced to just 21 months in prison and required to permanently register as a sex offender. As you can see, Spirit did a complete 180. They went from wanting to fly under the radar to being as loud and provocative as they could be. And it was because they needed eyeballs to create brand awareness. Customers that found their jokes funny or weren't bothered by it was exactly who they were targeting. For a company as wild and as controversial as Spirit Airlines, you would expect someone as animated as Richard Branson, founder of Virgin Airlines, to be in charge, but you would be mistaken. Unlike Richard, who is known for extravagant marketing ploys, Ben Baldanza, the architect of the Unbundle plan, is more of a staycation kind of guy who prefers to play board games at home with his wife and family. The career airline executive says, because we're a small airline, we have to be a little different, a little avant-garde. Besides the loud ad campaigns with sexual innuendos, Ben is credited for leading Spirit to becoming the first airline to charge for checked bags, and in his words, stop pouring water for free. This move ruffled some feathers as hardly anyone likes to feel nickel and dimes over every little thing, which led to Spirit receiving a cascade of complaints. Many of these complaints even found their way to the transportation department, who said that they received more complaints about Spirit than even the much larger airlines. Ben admits that the complaints are statistically higher, but excuses these stats because when compared to the number of travelers he moves from point A to point B, it's a teeny drop in the ocean. Where the Walmart or the McDonald's, not the Nordstrom's of the airline industry, no one walks into McDonald's and gets disappointed when they don't see filet mignon young on the menu. To Ben, the complaints stem from flyers' expectations, but the complaints were about more than just price. They had to do with baggage, reservations, ticketing, refunds, and the overall customer experience. If it costs a little more, take the other airline. To which Ben would respond, if any spirit passengers feel they've been treated badly, they should fly someone else. That's the way the free market works. Our job is to make sure that doesn't happen to a majority of customers. It's well known that the airline business is a tough business, and some people praise Ben for what he has accomplished. But the numbers don't lie. The airline continued to struggle with customer service issues and on-time performance, so much so that Ben Baldanza left abruptly in January 2016, the official reason being that his family had moved to Washington, D.C. The new CEO, Bob Fernando, was quickly elevated to the top job, but many saw him as a caretaker CEO who happened to be at the right place at the right time. He was already serving on the board of Spirit, and having been the CEO of Airtran Airways from 2007 to 2011, it made sense to have him fill the position for the meantime. The phrase the Spirit CEO Bob uses more and more often was the new normal. The competitive landscape had changed so much since Delta Airlines began to compete directly off of price. They were followed by American Airlines and United Airlines as well. What fueled this direct competition was the fact that all three major airlines were flushed with cash after emerging out of their respective bankruptcies with stronger balance sheets. As the competition began to take its toll on spirit, Bob had to pivot and devise a new strategy. He began to invest money into leveling up customer service by implementing a training program from a Walt Disney subsidiary called the Disney Institute. Bob went on record saying that in the past, Spirit almost went out of their way to poke customers in the eye. And once a business gets more and more competitive, you can't do that anymore. During Bob's relatively short stint, he managed to start the momentum and direction needed for Spirit to have a fighting chance at survival. The new CEO, Ted Christie, has worked diligently to continue the trajectory of Spirit, but it may be too little, too late. 
as talks about a merger with JetBlue are in the works. But what do you think about Spirit? Are you sad to see it go? Do you have a crazy customer service experience to tell? Share it in the comments below. And if you like this video, make sure to subscribe because I handpicked this next video for you. The preview is about to start playing below the thumbnail. I'll see you over there. Cheers. Thanks to X8 Web Design for sponsoring this video. Palmer Lucky is one of the youngest people to have founded two unicorn companies and is certainly one of the most important technologists in the 21st century. He's known by many for inventing the Oculus Rift headset that was acquired by Facebook for $2 billion before even launching their first